What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the I Tap That Cigar Show, coming to you live from the Drew Estate Experience Acid Studios. With me is my co-host for the night, Val Bradshaw. Val, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. It's been a crazy busy weekend, though, I've got to admit. <laughs> lots of shows happening, lots of fun, but uh, really glad to be here and super glad that you've got the guest you've got for tonight. Oh, exactly. We've got some great guests coming up for the uh, the whiskey and cigars shows. Um, got a couple cool other guests we got planned. Uh, so hopefully, um, either at the end of this month or right at the beginning of uh, December, we'll have a um, uh, another another fine person to 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 put you up against. This is it's, it's going head to head. It's battle <laughs> with Val, and then seeing how many of these aficionados she can crush with her knowledge. You know, now it's a. Uh, I, yeah, I, I I love learning. I'm not a whiskey bourbon scotch. I, you know, I, I like Jameson. I like the Cascade. But other than that, I'm not. But I love learning about it. It's just every oh, yeah. time I hear you talk or hear someone else, I just love the history. And I, I just I always love learning new stuff. And with whiskey, I don't know how many hours we've talked about it, Val. Now, but it just seems you, you just keep coming out with more knowledge. So it's um, um it's awesome. I love it. <laughs> well, you know that's what happens when you when you when you pay the dime. And do the time like I have for yeah. uh, schools and classes. You, you do come away with something, right? And, yeah, we, uh, that's and it's, it. You, gotta, and that's you it. keep you learning. Come away you read the something. books. Yeah. Yeah. So let's welcome a few people in the chat panel. We got Tony Costa. We got Diggins. What's going on? Jason Hawkins. Hey, Kevin Corbliss. Hey um, oh, they're coming in too fast now. Jeff Carpenter. Logan. What it be, brother? Ian, Jim Miller, Tyler Garcia, um, Andrew McCreary. What is going on, Andrew? So, all right, um, got a little bit different show. We're going to skip some of our uh, um, our beginning of the show stuff. Uh, I'm I'm sick as a dog. I'm uh, I'm I won't be. I got this is just plain diet coke tonight because I got a bunch of antibiotics. Um, so if you see my uh, I mean I'm not smoking. If you see my camera go off, that means I'm blowing my nose. So I got a box of tissues right here. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit back. I am going to try and moderate this. Everybody, anybody that has any questions, um, please feel free to ask. That's what this show is all about, just trying to get a bunch of knowledge out there. Uh, a couple people have reached out to me beforehand that couldn't tune in tonight um, because we were going a little bit earlier. So I've got some questions from uh, some people um, that, that wanted some questions answered, and they'll listen later on. So uh, without further ado, let me get rid of this bottom this bottom screen here, wherever it is, I got that. Where do I have that thing hidden at? It's uh, oh, it's way up here. So let, let's bring on this guy right Yo, here. Yo, what's going on, fam? What's good? What it be? What's what it good? be? What's good? Good to see you guys. Let me turn off my phone so that every three seconds. <laughs> I I know. I just I just turned mine off. And I'm sorry about that. I'm sorry. I'm I'm an amateur. I'm an amateur. <laughs> good to be here and uh, good to be seen. Good to be seen. Good to be above ground right now. So uh, very, very good. Very, very good. So uh, I feel like I am in the company of greatness uh, because we're talking about whiskey. I'm drinking a local beer brought to me by my local brother, Aaron. I'm going to bring Aaron in real quick. Aaron, come over here if you would. Aaron's right here behind me. You can see him. This is Aaron. Hey. Uh, so I got I got guys I do battle with daily and guys that got my back and everything like that. He's one of my top five, and uh, we always tool around and hang out. But I feel like I'm in the presence of greatness right now because – Val comes with this strong bourbon game out in your face right there, and I, I, I'm drinking a beer. And so everyone knows I'm a bourbon snob, and I'm a huge, uh, you know, uh, whiskey snob, and I'm drinking a beer. And for what for whatever reason, today has been a weird day, and uh, it's just par for the course. So, again, Val, thank you for coming on. Thank you for chatting with me and teaching us all, including the guy who claims he knows everything about whiskey, but to know whiskey and to be whiskey and to – understand whiskey is really about so val take it from here <laughs> well, well I, I'd, I'd like to before val gets started i just want to ask brad because there's one question that that i that i never knew um brad, we've never talked about this brad where did your where did your love of bourbon whiskey scotch where did your love of spirits come from was I, that from your dad or oh no, you know? oh i actually owe it to a guy named jason pelagato jason was uh, <laughs> uh is uh, a good buddy of mine uh from new york and he moved down here to phoenix um, and we started, so when I first moved here, I moved here to Phoenix from, uh, the Midwest. And if you move here from the Midwest, it's just weird. Okay. It's California cold 
meaning people have the personality of rocks, uh, never smile at you, and uh, just kind of keep themselves. And so I'm like Midwestern fun. So I'm like, hey, guys, what's going on? I literally walked up to my neighbor's house, knocked on the door, and the dude looked at me like I was having out lobsters crawling out of my nose. Looked at me and goes, what do you want? I'm like, uh, I just moved next door. I want to make sure you're not like crazy. I got three kids. I got a wife. I just want to say hi. And he's like, obviously, you've only been in Phoenix just a short time. I'm like, yeah, it's my third day here. And so far, it's not going well. You know, and so it's like, I'm like, help me out here, brother. Where are you from? He's like, I'm from Minnesota. I'm like, oh, nice. Awesome. Uh, and he's just like, we're just, it's just different. We don't, we don't do this around here anymore. <laughs> so like knock and bring your neighbor's cookies or anything like that. I didn't have cookies, so I felt kind of insulted. So anyway, I literally, I was like, okay, I want to have friends. I mean, anywhere you want to go, you want to have friends, right? So uh, basically, uh, I don't know strangers. So I just, I figured I'd walk around all my neighbors, knock on the door. Uh, half of them didn't answer the door. Half of them thought I was Job's witness. The other half thought like, you know, this guy's crazy, probably called the police somewhere, and I got away with it. So then I walked up and down my uh, up and down my street. Everyone had four things in common. The, the fourth one I did not know, but everybody had a gun because we're in Arizona. Everybody had an off-road vehicle because we're in Arizona. And then everybody had a motorcycle because we're in Arizona. And I was like, okay, I get to go buy a Jeep, a gun, and an off-road vehicle. So I did those things, and I started connecting with my neighbors. And then they were like, Hey, we play poker. Do you play poker? Now, at the time, I'm a pastor. And I'm like, uh, yeah, of course I play poker. Who doesn't play poker? I had never played a hand in the poker in my entire life. And I said, <coughs> I'm pretty sure I lied. I broke some commandment in here. And I said, I said, I host a, I host a poker game every Wednesday night in my house. You guys should come over and join me. <laughs> and uh, they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Come on. I'm like, what do you play? Seven card stud? Uh, do you play Texas Hold'em? Do you play uh, baseball? And I'm like, there's a card game named baseball? You know, and I'm like, uh, I, I said, yes, I play all that. And so one week they all came over. Everybody came over and some guy brought chips, some guy brought drinks, somebody brought cigars. And I was like, I can hang with this group. These can be my people. I have a new clan. I'm good. We're all right. We're going to be a tribe. It's going to be fun. And uh, this guy named Jason Pelagato brought cigars and he brought bourbon and he brought really good bourbon. And he was like, hey, man, do you want some bourbon? I'm like, Yes. Because I'm here with my boys. Why wouldn't I want bourbon? Okay. And I don't think to, this, to that day I had ever had a shot of real bourbon before. <laughs> and so he was like, I, so I just thought we were like, dude. So I take it and I'm like, yeah. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and I asked, I, I, I genuinely almost had an asthma attack. And I was like, what is happening at this point? He goes, you don't do that. You sip that. So my introduction to bourbon came at the expense of my friends and uh, the expense of my own uh, humility. So, I mean, it was it was just absolutely great. I had a great time. And I must have tried somewhere in the time. We, we did this for about three or four years straight. And somewhere between, I'd say, 25 and 30 <laughs> bourbons that were somewhere between $50 and $150, you know, as far as that. So I got to get, I got to taste some, some, albeit good bourbon. And so I just got a taste and a flavor for it. And every time I started smoking cigars with the bourbon, it really – accentuating the cigar that I had, regardless of what cigar it was. I was like, well, this tastes like this with that bourbon. This tastes like that with that bourbon. And I really did enjoy it. So when I started doing cigar reviews and everything else like that, I started drinking bourbon with that. And uh, so that was probably about 12, 15 years ago. Uh, and I just started drinking bourbon with my cigars, most of the time bourbon. And it was very, very good. And I really liked it. So I stuck with it. And today... And now I stepped up my game because I've actually had uh, – what did I have again? So, so see, by the way. Friday I brought I, e. H. Taylor single barrel yeah. and small batch. So we were drinking both of those just one after another. And he really loved the single barrel. That was his favorite. Yeah, single barrel was my favorite. There single you go. Val, Val, ha Val has that. Yeah, dude. That's <laughs> that's incredible. And, and I, I really feel terrible that I have no bourbon, but I have enough beer to equal one shot, I believe. You know, so <laughs> – Mm. In my uh, in my little repertoire. So, so I want to go back yeah. to you had mentioned that motorcycles. Like I had a place in Mesa, Arizona, right? Mm -hmm. So still no still no helmets. No, 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 no. I drive down uh -huh. here every day from my house <laughs> with my hat like this. I drive down just like this. Yeah, hold on for dear life. That's what I look like. Yeah. So yeah, 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 it's fun. And as a Canadian, mm -hmm. um, the the first time that I saw um, like. 
like a pistol, a gun. He uh-huh. was out in the open. And this is another thing that we don't expect to see. You, mm-hmm. you can't have it concealed. You have to display it, right? Right, right, yeah. right, right. Well, you yeah. can have it concealed so, in, the, in, in the great state of Arizona. Um, and I, I say the great state of Arizona because we still have our rights and we're proud Americans and all that kind of stuff. We irritate the rest of the world. We get that. Uh, but the but the reality is like, yeah, Arizona is that like you could you can conceal. We have a law now. You conceal <coughs> carry or you can open carry. You don't tell oh. anybody anything. Yeah, so you can conceal too. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Wow. Mm-hmm. What, what, and the what, other. Oh, no, go ahead. The other thing that that I still kind of giggle to myself about is when I had my place in Arizona, Mesa, Arizona. Okay. Uh, we were plan we were planning to go to the Grand Canyon, but we mm-hmm. had we had a small dog, and I didn't really want to have to be watching the dog for this for this big event of going to okay. the Grand Canyon. So the veterinarian down the street they had like doggy daycare, so I'm dropping Buddy off, and I'm all excited. Oh, I'm going to the Grand Canyon. And the reception says, receptionist says, oh, I've never been there. And and I'm like, well, this is a wonder of the world. You, you haven't been there? She says, it's a wonder of the world to you. To us, it's a great big hole in the ground. Right, right. <laughs> I, I, I t- Je- Je- Jessica grew up and uh, she was born in New Jersey, grew up in New Jersey, hung out on the streets of New York. I took her to the Statue of Liberty for the first time a couple of years ago. And, uh, and I'm like, <laughs> how, how, she goes, she, she thinks she was there like in, elementary school you know on a on a field trip but uh, she she didn't remember but i'm like how do you not you got this great statue and then you know at least go once in your adult life you know yeah oh yeah dude. i went i went to the statue of liberty when i was five years old and i live in canada yeah <laughs> you know how they name canada a... don't you c a yeah yeah you know in a D A. So let me ask you a question. Not not because I'm an irritating, you know, proud American, but you know, I, I you know, I, I, I kind of like my country, love it a little bit. Uh, what move, What made you move from America to to Canada? No, no. I uh, I'm born and raised Canadian, but I had a oh. winter home in Mesa. Oh, okay, 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 okay. Yes. okay. I was a young snowbird. Snowbird, you're a snowbird. Yeah, a young a young snowbird. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Brad, Brad, just uh, Canada, the only country with a telephone number. You can actually dial one eight hundred O Canada. The only, really, <laughs> the only country with a telephone number. I didn't know that. She, she, I had to tell, I had to tell Val that she, she didn't even know that. And uh, yeah, awesome. yeah. So, so, so Val, where are we starting with our journey tonight? First of all, we're going to start with me telling you which cigar I'm smoking. Yes, it's the Florida Sun Grown. Gotta love Jeff Forshowitz, right? And I love this cigar. It's easy to smoke. It's always got an excellent burn line. The flavors and the aromas are amazing. And and I just wish I could get more of them. But until the border opens, I can't get more of them. What are you yeah. smoking there, Brad? I'm smoking McAuliffe's A. They're Maduro. Ooh, nice. That, that Maduro yeah. they released. And uh, uh, we're probably going to end up, we may, be, we may bring them in. We're, we're testing all the cigars out right now. I heard there was so much buzz about the cigar. I wanted to taste it for myself. It's a good stick. It's a good stick. Is now, it a great stick? Is it the best one I've ever had? No, it is not. Okay, but it's a good stick. It's a solid it's Maduro. A good stick. Now, now, are they going to let you? Are they going to let you bring that in? Because didn't Ben Caliph just release a press release like two weeks ago? They're pulling out of online and they're only dealing with brick and mortars. So this is what I'm. This is what I'm. I, this is my. I saw the press release as you as you did too. And so if I'm, I'm not speaking for McAuliffe, what I understand. Yeah, yeah. As McAuliffe wanted to partner with uh, smaller guys that had retail and online shops. Oh, okay, so, okay. So would be, and we're not, we're not, you know, we're not Amazon, we're Radio Shack. Let's be honest, you know. Yeah. So I mean, that's kind of the uh, that's kind of the deal. And it's the same with you know the the guy. And I I don't know. I mean, I know Rob at Fox. Rob's a great guy. You know, some other guys like that. Where the guys in in Arizona necessarily, we're not huge guys. We're not the oh, okay. guys. We're not the you know the the Thompsons or the JRs. Oh, so they they were pulling out of the the bigger, yeah, they're super big ones, and kind of going to the smaller guys. Oh, okay. So, yeah. so it's a great <laughs> cigar. It's a really good cigar. So I have no I have no complaints about it, and it bears well. And with he's me. a nice he's a nice guy. I met him at IPCPR mm-hmm. and uh, had a nice little visit. So you know, he's, mm-hmm. he's a good guy. Are you um, talking about Alf himself, the dude? Yeah, yeah, the yeah. dude. Yeah, he's like yeah, a billionaire. The he's a billionaire. Yeah. So I just I, I don't care about you, but when I see a billionaire, I just want hundred dollars for seeing him. Yeah, a billionaire. I'm like, hey, dude, can I get a hundred bucks? Just because you're a billionaire, like I imagine, like someone comes to me, can, can I? People ask me for a buck, I'm like, yeah, I got a buck. 
I just want to ask you to win there for like a like hundred. Maybe like, <laughs> you get thousand dollars. You know, so. I, 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 you know, back years and years ago. I mean, I, I've I've always hung out with you know, like not all the time, but just I seem to be in a place where there's like always a bunch of rich people. So mm-hmm. okay, you know, I'll ask somebody. I'm like. Hey, could you like write me a? I don't want it, but could you write me a check for a million dollars and it wouldn't bounce? And some of them be like, "Yeah," and I'm like, "That's awesome." That's yeah, dude. Awesome. Yeah, 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 dude. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's crazy. What I have a question for you. This I feel terrible. Now I'll shut up for a second. What is the biggest check you ever cashed? I'm curious. Is that a question for? Kevin? I want to know. No, no, no. What, what's ever? What's the biggest check you ever got written to you? That I just want to know because it's it's crazy. I got one that was crazy. I was, I was, uh, I was, I, it was for a business, but I got it. I couldn't believe I, I had to write a check for it. So, what's the biggest check you ever wrote? I'm sorry, what's the biggest check you ever wrote? Well, you know, we're, we're, we're talking finances here. And I just want you to know that I have sold a couple of properties. Okay. For some pretty good coin. Okay. <laughs> okay. No, no, no. I was, I'm not trying to embarrass anybody. I, 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 I religiously write checks for way less than 100 bucks. Right, so I mean, oh, like, yeah. <laughs> so when I see that, I'm like, okay, well, I couldn't believe this. I wrote a check one time for two fifty, you know, two fifty thousand dollars. I couldn't believe it, and I was like, that's incredible. And I'm sure people do that all the time on the reg. Wow, I'm like, holy crap, people writing checks for millions of dollars. I guess it happens. You know, I guess. God, I oh, yeah. <laughs> that's crazy. But you just skip over that. I just thought it was crazy, dude. I, <laughs> I thought it was nuts. I was at a restaurant and I found a check for seventy five thousand dollars. It was made out to a, yeah, it was made out to a car dealership, and it had fallen out of this gentleman's portfolio. He was oh. on his way to buy a new car. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, and it had fallen out of his portfolio. So you know, okay. Being, okay. being the good person I am, yeah, <laughs> turned, That's it, awesome. That's turned awesome. it over. God. So yeah, no, I know, I know. <laughs> yeah. mm. So but we won't. So, go ahead. So go go on, Val. You're smoking the FSG. Let, yep. Let's uh, yep. where where are we where are we going tonight? Loving every minute of it, and as you can see, I'm surrounded by giant bottles of uh, bourbon. And okay. I just want I just want everybody to know this is movie magic. I inadvertently put my iPad kind of upside down so the camera is is low down, and I thought these look huge. I like the look. So movie magic. I'm surrounded by giant bottles of of whiskey, and I'm I'm glad for that. Now most of these bottles are unopened. Um, you know, when, when being that I'm the only one who drinks these, I have to be, I I believe I have to be careful how and when I open a bottle of whiskey because it's only me. And I, you know, sure, maybe you go through an ounce or two every night, but it still takes a long time to drink down one of those bottles. (coughs) And one of the things you really don't want to do is leave uh, a bottle of whiskey open for too long. Like six months is fine. A year can be okay. But the longer you leave a bottle, like this E.H. Taylor, for instance, this is the barrel proof. Mm-hmm. I've had this. I've, yeah, see, I've had this for a year now, so I've got to get drinking this. Um, once oxygen it's gets into life. that bottle, what's that? It's a rough life. It's a rough life. Rough life. Yeah, life. Yeah, I get to <laughs> once oxygen, once air gets into that bottle, um, the, the liquid itself is already starting to deteriorate. And, oh, wow. and so you're, lo- yeah, you're losing some of the, some of the properties, some of the aromatic properties. Uh, the taste can start to become a little one dimensional, a little bit flat. Um, mm-hmm. So, so, you know, I'm cautious. So, you know, sometimes people ask me, well, what would I pair with this particular cigar? And sometimes that's very hard for me to do because I haven't had that cigar with every bottle that you see here because I ration when I open the bottles, I don't ration really once I drink them, but I ration once I open them. So I can tell you that this FSG and this E.H. Taylor barrel proof, which I love. Now, when they say barrel proof, this is 63.75 alcohol by volume. This is a cask strength um, E.H. Taylor. And it is one of my favorite whiskeys of all time because I wow. like cask strength. Everybody, everybody, clear on what cask strength? No, is? Um, uh, I'm not a hundred percent what what cask cask strength is. Because you you also shot out a weird number that had more digits than I normally hear. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so again, here's another difference between Americans and Canadians. You guys go with proof. So a hundred proof, yeah, is 
fifty percent alcohol. Yeah. Basically, the proof. And this is when they used to like gunpowder to prove there was alcohol yeah, in yeah. the uh, in the liquid, right? Yeah. So, under proof. Anytime you see the number proof, you divide it by half, and that's your alcohol content, right? For the for the liquid. So 100 proof would be 50%. I'm not good at math, so 63 times two. Well, you know, let's say 63 times two. So this is a, quite a high proof. And the way they get there is, yeah, uh, yeah. Thanks. I'm thinking to my buddy. I'm like, uh, public school math. Uh, yeah. So get the calculator out. Yeah. <laughs> So what happens um, to be called whiskey, it's got to sit in the barrel for a minimum of three years. Some of them are longer, mm -hmm. um, but let, let's use three years. Okay. So what will happen with that barrel of whiskey if they want to bottle it as barrel proof? They only get X number of, you know, a 26 ounce bottle out of a barrel they only get x number of bottles from that barrel mm -hmm. but it is barrel proof it's higher alcohol you're going to get um you're, you're going to get different flavors and aromas and mm -hmm. and mouth feel the mouth feel is the biggest part if they if they want to extend that barrel and make more money off of it they'll water it down to 40 percent it can't go any less than 40 percent to be called whiskey and for me, a 40% alcohol of any description is a little thin. I like, uh, alcohol adds a viscosity. It adds a different kind of mouthfeel. Um, I get more weight on the palate from anything that's 43% or higher. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we're talking about when we talk proof or alcohol by volume. You'll see a lot of them. Um, no, not that one. I Let's I see. Like a 43%. Yeah. Like this Templeton rye, for instance, this is a 40%. Most of the bottles that you'll see on the shelf in the in the stores, they're going to be at 40%. And But then you go from there to the cask strengths. And it can go up like 40, 40 43, 46, sometimes 50, uh, sometimes 55. But then for real cask strength, you're in the 60s, 60% 60 oh, okay. plus. So in the 63%, I mean, you can spit fire with that if you want it, right? You can do fireball like that, right? Yeah. Making sure that I got everything right because I'll be testing this out later on another video. How yeah. do I the, start with you know with with Taylor? So I mean, the thing the thing is, this is oh, well, where's my camera? This is the the, the barrel proof, the H Taylor barrel proof, and you do not get the burn. You do not get that fire feeling that you can get from like like a neutral grain spirit that's you know pure alcohol because yeah. it's had time in the barrel so what's happening in the barrel there's an exchange of oxygen all that sort of thing um there's the influence of the wood that's coming into the liquid and so this is all softening okay the the the, the whiskey itself and you know that's you know we that's where you should be getting the color from sometimes some manufacturers add color uh, they use something called E150A caramel coloring, the same thing they use for Coca-Cola. Yep. I'm not particularly fond of um, the thought of E150A, but you're not supposed to be able to taste it. So, you know, what, what's there to criticize if you can't taste it? But the thing you have to remember is you cannot judge the oak influence on in a bottle when you look at the liquid in the bottle based on color because unless there's laws in place in the country that they're not allowed to add E-150A, they could be add or adding color just because they want to appeal to the, to the consumer because mm -hmm. they think a darker color means you know, a better quality whiskey because either the wood that they've used or, or how long it's been in the, rested in the barrel, whatever. But yeah, yeah be very careful when, when you, know, you pick up a bottle and you say, oh, look at the color. Well, just make sure it's not E-150A. Now I I I I, I want to ask a question because I would obviously defer to your knowledge. You, I mean, you are the whiskey queen at this point. I am nothing but a popper. Uh, my 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 question would be: Does doesn't I've heard this before? Doesn't the age of the whiskey inside the barrel also color it or discolor it in some it way? It can. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. and it depends on what what barrel you're using. For mm -hmm. bourbon, they can only use that barrel once. Right. right, right. So right. they can they 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 fill the barrel 
And then the master distiller decides how long, they mark the barrel and they decide how long that liquid is going to rest in that barrel. And for sure, depending on how they've charred the inside of the staves, sometimes it's a light char, sometimes it's a heavy char, all of those things will add to you know the, the finished product, the finished liquid, whether it's darker or what the aroma is, what the taste are. Like if you get you know, baking spices and caramel, that sort of thing, that's oak influence. That's coming from time spent in barrel. Mm -hmm. So uh, I always like to do a little bit of research on a product. Oh, I'm sorry. I do a lot of research on products. And I think everybody should. It's your dollar. You should, you should know what you're drinking. You should know if you like it. And you should know why you like it. And you, and you get that through knowledge. So I always try to find out you know on the bottle how long has it ha has it been resting in oak like i say with bourbon they can only use that barrel one time so if they've got it in there for 10 years 15 years is pushing it for bourbon to be honest it's mm -hmm. too hot it's too hot to leave it uh mm -hmm. longer than 10 or 15 years scotch they can get away with 15 20 20 30 years they can get away and you can still be in that sweet spot for me the sweet spot for scotch is 15 to 30 years. The sweet spot to me for bourbon is more like 10 to 18, maybe 20 years. And again, this all goes back to what is what what is that distil master distiller doing with yeah. his barrel management, everything else? Because yeah. that could change. There's variables. I, but I as would a say, general rule. I would say mine's 8.2 months to at least 15.3 <laughs> months and a quarter. With, with a week, <laughs> give a week, give or take a week, right there. I have no freaking idea. I love it so much. I just, I love the taste of it. It's amazing listening to somebody like you. I can listen to you for hours and days, believe it or not, because I, I, I I'm asked all the time, like guys are asking what my favorite bourbon is. Uh, I don't know that I have a favorite bourbon. I like so much of it so much. It's the same thing with cigars. I'm like, there's so much of it that I like and I enjoy. Now, there's ones that I prefer, you know, over other ones. Sure. Um, sure. I do prefer uh, Woodford. Knob Creek, Angel's Envy, uh, Rye. Um, I like Rye's Bullet Rye, uh, but see, I'm not. Uh, yeah, there's Woodford. I, Woodford's such a great in their in their uh, Double Oak is really good. Um, yeah. You know, so that's a that's another good one that I enjoy. But for me, it's always I don't drink whiskey by itself. I always drink it with a cigar. And so I have right. other friends of mine who are whis whiskey kind of stewards who uh, who shame me and blaspheme the name of Bradley Reed. Because I should never, he said, you're, you're ruining the whiskey when you smoke it with a cigar. And I said, well, if it's smoky, why well, aren't I just adding to the ambiance, if you would? Uh, so yeah. my question is, am I a heretic or not a heretic for smoking cigars with my whiskey? Val, I defer to you. You are not a heretic at all. Because you're <laughs> drinking whiskey for enjoyment. And to add to that enjoyment, you're adding a cigar. Now, if you were doing, if you were claiming to be the world's number one whiskey reviewer, right? Whiskey reviewer. Right, right. Then I would have a problem with you smoking a cigar with that whiskey because mm -hmm. it is going to change what's happening right. on your palate, right? right so, right. you know, there, there's, there's two ways to approach whiskey. One is social and the other mm -hmm. is as a technical tasting. And in a technical tasting where you are, where you are, passing judgment, so to speak, on the liquid, based on mm -hmm. what you're tasting, you owe it to that whiskey to give it the purest environment on your palate that you can. That's why I'm number two. I'm never going to be number one. I'm satisfied <laughs> number two. Uh, I'm okay being number two, just so you know. I am. I'm just, no, I'm like, I'm number 2,485 somewhere in the <laughs> list of people or something like that. I know that. Um, but it's, it's fascinating because there is a lot of, you know, um, ebb and flow with different ways. Now, these are a lot of what I see down there, you know, Kentucky this, Kentucky that, Tennessee, you know, things yeah. like that. Where do you stand with Canadian blended whiskey? You know, you got your Crown Royals, you got your Johnny Walkers and things like that. Uh, what, what's your, what's your, now Johnny Walker isn't Canadian, is it? That's Scotch. That's, that's Pendleton, Pendleton. Yeah, that's Pendleton. Scotch. It, that's, that's Scotch. Okay. See, I don't know. See, Kevin, why am I even here? I don't know anything. <laughs> do you like the Garrison Brothers out of Texas? Have you had Garrison Brothers? Oh, you know, like I say, it depends on where you live, what you can get. I, I'm not even from. Like, it depends on the market. Who cares? I'll, about, I'll right? send you a bottle, Val. I'll send you a bottle of Garrison Brothers Cash Strength. 
I, I would love that. We we have to be very careful because it's actually illegal you to ship me. alcohol into Canada. Oh, I'll <laughs> drive it across the border. Right. Yeah. <laughs> when the Gator sits out of Texas, the humidity and the barrels are able to get amazing flavors and less time, like in Kentucky, for instance, because of it. And they, they in the Jim Murray's Bourbon Bible, the, the cash drink for the Garrison, if you like cash drink, oh, it is amazing. Yeah. Did you hear him? Yeah, yeah. 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 I did, and and yeah. I would love to try it. I would. I'm I'm a big cask strength fan. Mm. Um, so getting back to your question, I'm actually glad you asked this um, because it, it it strikes me that you're not just a bourbon fan, Brad. Or do you no. prefer Bradley or Brad? Bradley. Yeah. Bradley. Bradley. I'm sorry. Okay. It's okay. No so, problem. Sorry. Um, you you had asked about Canadian whiskey. Mm -hmm. And and you're absolutely right. Uh, Canadian whiskey typically is a blend, you know, corn, uh, wheat, barley, whatever grains they want to throw in there. Mm -hmm. um, we call it rye, but yeah. most Canadian whiskeys are no longer made of rye. They're mostly made of corn, but we still call it rye. Oh, wow. So you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there are a few 100% rye whiskeys from Canada, but let's talk about the blends first. Um one of the blends, for instance, uh, no, one of the pure ryes is this um, Alberta Premium. Now, this bottle of Alberta Premium retails in my market for about $28, which is just a bargain. It's a 40%. Um, I like it. I like it a lot, but it's for most people, it would be a mixer. Whereas I heard somebody mention the Whiskey Bible. Ooh. This Alberta Premium, this is the, the cask strength. So the first bottle I showed you is 40%. This one's at 65.1%. And this is this is the one that did get the claim of World Whiskey of the Year. But that's not meaning it's the world's greatest whiskey. It just means that the writer of that book happens to really like this. And so, you know, for his money, this is this is a world whiskey. And I tend actually to agree with that assessment okay because a lot of whiskey a lot of rye whiskey is shipped to the united states to be repackaged with a label that is usa based and then sold as a usa whiskey have you really? ever heard of yeah, yeah. Do not ruin this for me, Val. I feel like I'm going to touch the core. A, a complete roadblock in my beautiful whiskey tasting palette. But you're going to go ahead and do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. <coughs> you, you, this is in Wikipedia. You can look it up. Now, I'm not saying Wikipedia is always right. But in this case, they kind of are. Oh, man. So there's, there's a little place called MGP of Indiana. And I'm reading right now. This is called Midwest Grain Products of Indiana. It's a distillery in Lawrenceburg, Indiana. And what they do is they produce a lot of whiskeys that are labeled under a different name, okay? So, like for instance, Templeton, where's my Templeton? Mother box? bus bucket, <laughs> mother bus bucket. What is happening? <coughs> what is going on? Templeton? <laughs> this bottle of Templeton rye, I've had it for years, um, it, it is processed and bottled by Templeton rye spirits, but it's distilled in Indiana. So this is just one example of, you know, a, a, is this this way a big distillery I mean, I just, offering I bottles like an artisanal <laughs> product. Another one that is hugely popular and sells for two three hundred dollars don't do it whist Don't is whistle it. pig rye mother i knew it whistle pig yeah. anyone who and names it, their their whiskey whistle pig deserves to be blown out of the water anyway yes you know. <laughs> the, boss, the boss is good though so I know, I know huge, hugely pro popular rye but the thing is a lot of their spirit is shipped in from canada and on the back of the label of Whistle Pig Rye, unless it's changed in the last year, it states product of Canada. So wow. the product of Canada, if it's rye that they're getting, is likely similar to this $28 bottle, but they turn around 
and good marketing, they sell it for two or three hundred bucks. Ah, oh. ah, oh, Brad. So, yeah. Thank you, Kevin, for having me on during my world today. I appreciate that. I remember that during Christmas time. Yeah. Um, this is uh, this. Is there any other way you'd like to destroy my life at this point? Sure. Let's just, let's just yeah. keep going. I'm sure. Yeah, we can keep going. And sooner or later, you'll tell me Jack Daniels actually produced in Canada, shipped here uh, for all the great Kentucky Americans to drink down, thinking they're actually drinking Kentucky whiskey, but they're not. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. Time out right there, Bradley, because Jack Daniels. Well, Tennessee. In, Tennessee. It's not Kentucky. I went to Tennessee. It's Tennessee I went to Tennessee. Whiskey. I left Tennessee. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I thought she was about to destroy everybody. What are you speaking of, Jack I Daniels? Yeah, it's I'm... actually made in Mexico. Not a lot of people don't know that. You know, yeah. Oh, man. Oh, man. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I knew that about, you know, Jack Daniels and, right. and so on and so forth. And, um, yeah, sorry about that. I, I, I did not slip my mind. Probably because so, you warped it so much with your yeah. former information. I don't know what I'm thinking. Like so, that, so we're gonna we're gonna interject one uh, uh, viewer question here on my sign here. You'll notice I have whiskey spelled. Is it spelled the right way? Because it's spelled with an e y. And someone asked me, what's the difference between e y and then just y? I don't I don't know. There's there's two. Acceptable spellings of whiskey. One is E-Y, and the other <laughs> one is where you drop the E and just have the E. So the way it kind of comes down is if the country has an E in its name, they spell it with the E. So the United States, whiskey with the E. Ireland, whiskey with the E. Japan, just a Y. Scotch, just the Y. Yep. Yeah. Get out of here. That's how it's determined? I, I feel a millennial thing coming on. I just do. I Brad, did somebody you... somebody found a spelling bee somewhere and got a participation trophy for that for that spelling. That's why Brad, I Brad, did you know that? I did not know I that. Have, it... I did not know that, but I have heard that before. I have okay. heard that before. Yeah. I would just put the guys <laughs> infinite wisdom on this and I would just call myself a complete heretic and just go hide in the hole at this point. Because I know nothing about whiskey. I know nothing. Other than I like drinking it and I'm sure I'm gonna have a bottle tonight just so you know. Weep my sorrows away in a corner. Somewhere. A whole bottle. Yeah. 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 Cask strength. Like, really do it yeah. to yourself, all right? But it's it's not a hard and fast rule. You can spell it either way. It's just that the Americans use the E and the Canadians don't. And the Scotch, the Scot well, Scotland doesn't use it. I, I will say this, and I, I think it's important to bear, you know, to, to, to have a conversation about this. Whiskey is not meant to be shot. It's meant to be sipped, from what I've understood. And in order, in order to really get the ambiance of it. it doesn't mean you can't take a, a nice sweet so when i usually drink pour a glass i pour two to three fingers um you know two to three three shots and sip that for a, a, a solid you know three to four hours almost you know it's just a little by sure. little my tongue is there any kind of distinction that you would make in tasting whiskey like for example um i've been to many different whiskey tastings many different scotch tastings uh and been honored to participate in them as a judge uh and then also Ooh, wow uh yeah it's been kind of fun um nice don't get too don't get too excited these are like buddies of mine right there at restaurants uh so <laughs> I didn't, yeah, marvin shankin wasn't calling me like bradley can you please come down to <laughs> Arthur like, yeah yeah like, yeah Mar marvin and i are i love marvin's a good guy but yeah he's never gonna call me for that uh the the reality is um be between different whiskeys uh we <laughs> have um either a, a little bitty shot of coffee or a chocolate a dark chocolate to close the cleanse palate. And we'd also drink, um, one guy had apple juice that he swore was cleanse his palate. And then we'd, I just, the rest of us just have water. So is that an accurate way to cleanse your palate between whiskeys? That's what I was given. So I don't know if that's accurate or if that's, but in cigars, you do very similar things. So, And again, I'm going to go back to my qualifier. Is the event a social tasting or is it a technical tasting? I do not think, I don't think there's anything technical about me, Val. <laughs> just so you know, I just don't think it's more social than technical for sure. If you're judging, it should be technical. And if it's technical, you shouldn't have any other influences because you know what? As soon as you say apple, that's all I smell. I just smell apple. Okay. Right? Okay. Okay. And, and, well, and God forbid, and I didn't gonna... take the apple. Just so you know, I didn't take the apple. I was, I yeah. Was, I didn't take the apple. That was Eve. Um, that, yeah. <laughs> but, I, but I mean, in, in all, in all, that honesty, was Adam. Yeah. Was yeah. Adam was this, yeah. He, he did first. <laughs> Anyways, but the, but the, but the, but the reality, 
behind it. I guess there's a they wanted to qualify it between you know different different um uh, what do you call it? different uh, um uh, whiskeys expressions and stuff. But, expressions yeah, yeah I guess they call it expressions um and there were years I mean there were jumps in years between like there was one for like a five year a ten year a thirty one year you know and these were scotches uh, as well so um the one I'm, the one I'm referring to uh, was more of a scotch one than it was a I know I know it wasn't a bourbon right. it was a scotch one. Um, right. and, and I'm not a big scotch guy, believe it or not. I'm not really a big scotch guy. I, uh, I feel when it comes to, um, whiskeys, scotches of everything tend to be a lot lighter for me than, than anything else. A little, a little more, um, some seem to be a little more wet, a little more too, too wet or too dry in my personal sure. opinion. Um, and bourbon for whatever reason has always got the perfect sting, the perfect, um, uh, I'm trying not to. My buddy Cody's going to see this later, and he's a professional here in Arizona. He's going to judge me and tell me I said everything wrong. Um, but uh, referencing Cody, uh, you know, they're going to be. The, the, I just I, when I, it's that it, huh? I know, it's like right on that right on the the back of your the back of your palate where the bitterness the back palate. Is, yeah the back yeah. where the bitterness is, um, and that's why I like a good strong cigar to hit me is back there. But the, there's – and bourbon, most bourbons do hit me back there. Not all of them do, but no, almost no scotch does. I've not had a scotch okay. that ever hit me back there, you know, uh, and okay. that's why I really don't prefer them. Okay. Yeah. Now, you know, there could – you know, I don't know what you were drinking, right? Mm-hmm. You, you, ha- you kind of have to have – give me a chance Bel- maybe Belvedine, to Belvedine? give me a lift. Belvedine? You know? Belvedine? Um, or is it Bel- Belvanine? Bel- Belvanine? Belvanine. Belvini. See, I don't even know. I'm telling you, <laughs> blue collar dumb, blue collar dumb. You know, if it's not Jack or Jim, blue collar dumb. Uh, the uh, yeah, Bel- Balvini or whatever it was. Balvini. 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 And it was beautiful. Yeah. It was a wonderful little it's a event. Great scotch. Um, it and is. I really did enjoy it, uh, but definitely not with a cigar. But by nature, of the fact that there wasn't a, it, it just didn't hit me in the back. But I, but every bourbon uh, that I've had, not I've, I've not had, you know, I, I would say I've probably had. On the scale of um, bourbons, uh, 100 to 150 different bourbons, I would say that. And I don't necessarily agree with Shankin on his uh, whiskey advocate, Dinkle, right. Uh, right. Uh, bottle and bond. I, I, I was, I was like, I mean, it was, a, it was, it was good. Very bready, very bready on that. Um, but it was smooth, very bre- bready, but very smooth. So. I didn't see what the big deal was, as opposed to a uh, Knob Knob Creek single Knob barrel. Creek. Yeah, yeah, Knob Creek single barrel, which I was like in love with, and I quite quite frankly is my go to, you know, for right. most. Of it. So, um, but what do you think about the like the whiskey advocates when they go, you know, number one like for for bottle and bond, Dinkles uh, or Dickel, uh, their bottle and bond, um, and the other. What do you think about those? Like I, I obviously I have strong opinions about cigar aficionados top twenty five list. What do you think about whiskey aficionados top twenty five list? You know the only dickel I've had is this uh, sour mash. That's the only mm-hmm. one I've ever had. So mm-hmm. when I say it's the only one I've ever had, that means it it didn't inspire me to go any further. Okay. Okay. Let's okay. put it that way, right? And okay. that before the border closed down, I had access. I, I you know I could travel to any market. And pick up a bottle of whatever I wanted. Okay. Um, when it when it comes to the magazines, I think they're a great reference. I, I get the magazines. I enjoy reading them. I find them I, I find them to have great entertainment value. But when it comes to a technical tasting, you can't beat education. And and I hundred percent recommend that people sign up for some kind yeah. of a whiskey education class. Start slow. Practice, you know, your basic aromas, your your mm-hmm. caramel, your brown sugar, your butterscotch. Make sure you and Kevin and I have talked about this. Make sure you know your difference between black pepper and white pepper. Here's a huge difference. Make sure you know your vanillas. Here's a big difference between um, you know, pure vanilla, vanilla bean, and Madagascar vanilla. They're different. Yeah. Learn yeah. those things. Help yourself to be a better taster if that's mm-hmm. what, you know, if it matters to you. If it doesn't matter to you, well, you know, I'm still going to talk about it. Well, it matters well, to me. You've inspired me not only because I have a dinner date in about 15 minutes, but I also need to sign up for a whiskey class as well. Do a whole video on it and send it to you for your approval 
so that I can get into the Val School of Excellence. Uh, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm, looking, I'm looking forward to that. I really am. When you take that class, pay attention to what kind of glass they pour it in. Yes. This is a Glen Cairn, okay? This is, this is shaped to be a very good whiskey nosing glass, uh, nosing yes. and tasting glass. And, you know, you mentioned that you poured a three fingers, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But in a technical, like, that's fine for social, okay? But in a technical tasting, you only want to fill that liquid to the widest part of the bowl, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the the vapors will lift a little bit to that, they, they narrow in this channel, and then they open up again just as it gets to the rim. And that's what you want to be able to nose with. Mm -hmm. The other thing you got to do, and David Garofalo put this into better terms than I'd ever heard before. I have seen a lot of nosers, tasters, go one nostril and then the other. And I agreed with that because there was a difference. But he explained on one of his tasting shows was that one of your nostrils even if they're both plugged, Kevin, but one of them always is a little more congested than the other one. So that's why you'll see a lot of nosers tilting their head and using one versus the other. The other trick you do, not trick, it's not a trick, that's not a fair word. The other uh, method of nosing a glass, because uh, taste is 80% smell, so practice nosing. That's, that's very, very important, just nosing. The other thing you wanna do is you wanna nose whatever's in that glass with your mouth closed, and then you want to nose it again yeah, with your mouth yeah. open. I've done okay? that before. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. That before. Yeah. yeah. Now, normally, I do use a Glen Cairn all the time. Mm -hmm. But I received this little cradle glass um, from my friend Gordon. All right. Mm -hmm. He's, a, he's a, a great cigar guy in Scotland. And it's what I have found out of all the whiskey. And I've got like five different styles of whiskey tasting glasses. This is the only one that I absolutely love besides my Glen Cairn. Now, to fill it to, to the widest part of the bowl is no danger because it's got a heavy base. The other thing mm. I like about the heavy base is mm. I can cradle it, but I don't have to worry about the warmth of my hand heating up the whiskey because it's got a very thick base. It can't heat it up. And it's what just was, very comfortable to hold. What was that guy's name, Gordon? My friend Gordon, he's in Scotland. Yeah. Gordon Nutt, Degan, yeah. 15802 North Cape Creek Road, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, <laughs> 85032. If you feel so inclined, my dear friend, um, I would gladly pay you Tuesday for one of those classes today. Um, so, but Val, I do have to go. I'm, I'm looking at my at my right and getting out of here. Kevin, again, I'm so sorry hey. I have to bounce so early. Um, love you guys. Kevin, you know I love you to death. You're a brother from another mother. Val, your knowledge in this short amount of time is both humbling for me and inspiring at the same time. I genuinely mean that. Thank you. It's awesome. It's really, really cool. And so I'll catch yeah, you guys. You're catch great. You on the social side. Kevin, thank you so very much. All right, Brad. Me. We'll we'll have you on again here soon. So absolutely love you guys. All right. Love you too. See you later on. See ya. Bye bye. Bye bye. All right. Yeah, I was hoping to get them a little bit a little bit longer, but uh great. but but um but we can we can continue because we we've got questions. So um uh, where where are we so continue with 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 your with class, Val. Okay. So one of you know I always say get a little bit of education. So I've got this book handy. It's called Tasting Whiskey. This one is great. It's by Lou Bryson, and he really does give a lot of pointers on how to approach tasting whiskey because it's you know it's art and science, but you really want to kind of think about the science of what you're tasting and what you're nosing. And so I highly recommend Lou Bryson's Tasting Whiskey book. Great author. Um, and and if, you know, if there's a class available in your market, take it. But, I mean, there's a lot of uh, videos you can watch. You just have to be cautious of what you're watching. I have watched some YouTube videos, and I'm like, mm, really? But, again, you know, um, unless you're prepared to go into a structured class, you just – you need to be cautious sometimes, some of the messages that they send. Like, for instance, the way I got into E.H. Taylor. I, I was in uh, Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I was visiting um, uh, a liquor store, and because we have liquor, you know, separate liquor stores, and the, 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 or the workers let me sample some whiskeys. And I was, I was just kind of getting into bourbons. This was a few years ago. And when I tasted them, I kind of looked at, at the person who was helping. She's a friend of mine. I'd known her for years. She and I both worked at a golf course together for six seasons. But I kind of looked at her and, and I was kind of, really? Really? This, this is what you want me to buy? Because to me, they just, they, they didn't jump out at me. 
And then she said to me, would you like to buy what, would you like to taste what I keep in my bar at home? And that was when she showed me the E.H. Taylor. That's when she let me taste the E.H. Taylor. Now, I am telling you right now, anybody who's listening, if you can get your hands on any E.H. Taylor, I don't care which one it is, they're all good. And they're all <coughs> worth the money. You know, I'd like to say that every bourbon, you know, that's over 30, 40 bucks is worth it, but they're not. They're really, really not. And uh, But E.H. Taylor is amazing. And, and when I first take, this is my third bottle of barrel proof. That's how much I love that one. I was in Atlanta and I stopped into Reds uh, in Atlanta and, and I just thought they were a beer store. And they had this amazing wine selection that blew my mind. And I was so excited about that. And then I thought I better check out the whiskey section. And I come around the corner and she's got two or three bottles of this barrel proof. And I says, where did that come from? She says, she says, it showed up. She says, I, you know, I was sent like two bottles. And I says, well, now you're down to one because I have to buy one. And, and that's another thing to plan for. When you go to a different city and if you're, you know, a sincere whiskey, uh, a person who sincerely wants to learn about whiskey, check out other markets. See what other markets have for sale. Because not every market sells, you know, the same products. It, it, it goes the same um, so, for cigars, you know, um, absolutely. When, whenever we travel, we, you know, we always find new stuff. It's like, oh my God, I've never seen this before, you know, and, uh, or it's like, oh, you, you carry this. I've heard about this, but it's not available anywhere near me. And, you know, if, if you get a, an online retailer, you know, like Jeff at Corona that doesn't sell singles, you know, sometimes you don't want to buy a five pack or a whole box of cigars. So right. yeah. So yeah, it's yeah. whiskey cigars, uh, um, um, the same, same thing. Um, yeah. We had a uh, um, um, uh, a question. Um, uh, Pre-prohibition era whiskeys are always talked about. Is there such a uh, thing uh, as a sought after prohibition whiskey? Were there made whiskeys made during prohibition that that are really sought after, or is it always just the pre? I would say it's the pre. Don't forget that prohibition had a couple of things attached to it. Like first of all, they're just just like we're faced with the anti-tobacconists today, which we have to fight all the time. We need a half a million voices of pro-cigar smokers fighting the anti-tobacconists for, for hand-rolled premium cigars. I'm not saying for tobacco in general, but for hand-rolled premium cigars. Um, back in the day of Prohibition, they, they, there was also a war involved. So certain raw ingredients were needed for other things and liquor wasn't one of them uh and really it was prohibition that got canada basically okay that's not quite right it was actually the first world war that got canadian whiskeys on the map because we were still able able to produce whiskeys whereas the states had limited resources for producing whiskey so um, when it comes to good luck finding a pre prohibition bottle, um, I've never seen one. Oh, okay. But, I, I, I didn't know if that was a thing. Like I said, someone asked, I'm like, oh, I, I just, the way he said it, I'm like, okay, that just must be a popular thing. Okay. So it's really rare then. Okay. So uh, <laughs> the thing is <coughs> during pro prohibition, it was Canadian club that really made it into, you know, the illegal, uh, I don't know what you guys called them the illegal places, the, the illegal yeah. speakeasies yeah. where people, you know, snuck their little nips of alcohol. Um, so Canadian club, you know, they were able to transport that down the Eastern seaboard. Um, rum had a, had a much bigger role to play in terms of prohibition because at that time the Americans could st still travel to Cuba and, you know, drink their faces off in Cuba, drink a lot of rum, but um, yeah, Canadian club, that's, that's really where it got its foothold um in in the american market and it's and it's still popular today you know right. now, now is that is that back yeah oh yeah cc i mean i was a bartender and it was always you know the first time someone asked me for a cc and sprite and i'm like i don't know what that is canadian club I'm like oh okay makes sense cc you know cc you know just yeah. shorten it up now I was back in the prohibition i i found a, a weird fact that a uh, canadian whiskey whiskey used to be called brown vodka was that back then when did that stop you know, have you ever heard that term or in your lifetime of like when that like it was called brown vodka? You know, it, it could have been. I'm, you know, I'm not up to date on that one. Um, <coughs> but what what did happen, 
was the the green spirit was typically made of vodka. I, I'm sorry, of um, wheat and or potato at the time, but it it can be a very bland flavored spirit. It's supposed to be a neutral spirit, right? So what made the difference was when um, German immigrants started adding rye grain to, you know, the wheat or the, or the potato spirit that they were making. And people really enjoyed that little extra bite, that little extra taste that they got from um, the rye grain being added. And that's actually how Canada started with, the, with being able to call any kind of Canadian whiskey rye because of that rye grain being added. And, you know, the, the, it's only really been the, the resurgence in the interest in rye in the United States has really only been in the last, hmm, not even in the last decade, I'd have to say it's in the last five or six years that, that rye has really started to make a comeback <coughs> in, the, in the U.S. market. And as I, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of it is, uh, is Canadian whiskey product that's rebottled and labeled as, you know, something that looks like it's from the States, when in fact, if you read, if you read the whole book, not just the last page, you'll see yeah. that it's a product of Canada. Wow. Because Canada, Canada is a master at rye grain. Rye grain yeah. is very, very hard to work with. It really gums up your machinery. It, it, these weird ca uh, enzymes, you really need, you need to know your way around the rye grain. I talked to a local distiller here and it took him, you know, several attempts before he was able to make a bottle of rye because it turns to concrete. It turns to cement if you don't know what you're doing with it. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, reading one article and doing a little bit of research for the show and um, uh, they're talking about rye whiskey and the, and the rye had to be turned, you know, while yep. it was in. And uh, they, they would, uh, uh, the, the guys would get develop something called monkey shoulder where one arm <laughs> would actually be longer than the other from constantly <laughs> getting in there and, and turning you know, turning the rye, and I'm like, wow, that's a yep. uh, you, you don't you don't hear that with any other any other grain. Um, and, and, in, and and in the same article that they talked about something I'd never heard before or didn't even know it was a thing, you know, something called White Dog, an unaged American whiskey is called yep. White Dog. Um, I didn't know there was such a thing as an unaged whiskey. What do they they just make it, bottle it, and sell it right away? Well, and again, White Dog is a raw spirit. Um, uh, to be called whiskey, it should actually spend time in barrel, okay? But the, because not all countries have the same kinds of rules, and because some producers take liberties, that they might call it whiskey. But to me, whiskey is a brown spirit that has spent time in barrel. I, I don't even have a bottle of the white stuff. I'm, I'm not really interested in drinking it. I've tasted it. I'm not interested in owning it. Okay, it's so, me, so, it's, so it's still white. They're not adding that coloring to make it dark. It's still... It's, it's still white. A, okay, it's, it's I, a I guess white hence, spirit. Okay, I guess okay. hence the white dog. So Okay, so that's uh, oh, weird. But yeah, I, I never... You know, as a, a, a viewer question, I'm like, I've never heard of that. You know, and um, um, so super, super cool. Um, and then you had talked about earlier, and I don't, I don't know how long it's been. You, you had brought up Japanese whiskey, <coughs> and we we're talking about the spelling. Is that a new thing? Like, it seems like everybody's talking about Japanese whiskey. The la actually, in the last six months, that's all everybody's doing is drinking. So maybe I'm just <laughs> hearing more about Japanese whiskey. Is that new? Is, is did the Japanese just getting into the whiskey industry? No, I forget exactly what year. It, I'm pretty sure it was like the 1920s, 1930s, maybe. Oh, so it's going back even that old. Okay. Yeah, it, it goes back. And again, don't quote me on this because I'm not sure. Um, but there, And don't ask me his name because I can never remember it. But there was a Japanese fellow who went to Scotland because he wanted to learn about the distilling process. So off he went to Scotland to learn everything he could about distilling. And he took that knowledge back to Japan and... Was it Nika? I could be wrong, but there, there, you know, there is. Um, that's what kind of started the whole Japanese distilling craze. Was because he had learned a lot, and he'd learned it really well. And and he had married a woman from Scotland, 
So between the two of them, they were able to, you know, go back to Japan and really start the, the Japanese distilleries versus sake, which is what they, you know, typically had. And some of those whiskeys are, are delightful. They really, really are good. Uh, they can't call them scotch. Scotch is a protected name, but they can call them whiskey. And so, no, Japanese whiskey has been around for a while. Uh, Taiwan, Cavalan, that's one that's relatively new. When did I first taste a Cavalan? That must have been about 2012, 2013 that I first tasted a Cavalan. And that's, uh, you know, that's a, that's a Taiwan whiskey. And it's, and it's good. I've got, a, I've got a beautiful bottle of Cavalan single malt whiskey on my shelves back there. And it's it's a beauty. It's really very nice. Um, and again, uh, it's what they finish them in too. Yeah. Um, uh, Chico asked, "Why is Japanese whiskey so expensive? Is it is it expensive compared to, you know, regular whiskeys?" Or it will be be expensive because of import taxes, right? Oh, okay. The the cost goes up depending on you know where it's made, that sort of thing, and what what the agreements are. You know, like, for instance, now there's a tariff on, you know, certain wines that's coming. So you're going to see an increase in, in cost over that. Um, but but Japanese whiskeys, you know what? They'll price it at whatever consumers will pay. Oh, and yeah. That, consumers yeah. are willing to pay it. Well, that's on the consumer, right? Yeah. That, that's on you. If you're willing to pay that, that amount of money. It's like I was saying earlier. I, I don't buy whistle pig because... Canadian whiskey. Why, why would I spend two or three hundred dollars on a bottle when I know it's Canadian whiskey that I can get for way less than than what they're charging? That that was the uh, um, I, I had heard that story years ago on uh, Grey Goose, the vodka. You know uh, that that was yeah. like that was like a five dollar bottle of vodka. They put, <laughs> they put put it in a fancy uh, uh, bottle, brought it over here to the states. Everybody <laughs> loves it. You know, they're, they're paying what, whatever it is, 30, 40, whatever, $50, whatever. They're, uh, and then they end up selling that, you know, and that was a billion dollar brand, a billion sure. dollar brand from some guy traveling through Russia and just having to come <laughs> across just a really good vodka that was cheap. Yeah. <coughs> and you don't, you don't even have to look at liquor. You can look at Perrier <coughs> water. Look at how much, you know, a bottle of Perrier water costs. Now, a lot of people think that they can't drink tap water in their in their communities. I'm not one of them. Tap water is fine with me. Uh, luckily, where I live, I'm not saying that all tap water is great, but in my community, it is. But a lot of people, they went crazy for Evian. They went crazy for Perrier. They go, you know, people, people, like, people like to feel they're having an affordable luxury, right? It's called the lipstick economy, if you, if you really want to kind of go back in history, um, Leonard Lauder of the Estee Lauder companies coined the term the lipstick economy, basically saying that no matter what's happening in terms of the economic climate, the financial climate, women are still willing to spend money on lipstick. And they'll spend a lot of money on lipstick. Because I, I'll tell I, you I know, yeah. <laughs> women, when they find a lipstick that they love, they marry that lipstick. They might date their blush, they might date yeah. their mascara, but they marry their lipstick. Don't take it away from them, they'll be angry. <laughs> oh, that, 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 yeah, yeah, that is an understatement right there. Um, uh, another viewer question, uh, why don't all whiskeys have an age dating on them? Because there's age statements and then there's NAS, non-age statements. Okay. So, Back in the day, back until about, I think it was the 70s or so, every Scotch whiskey that was out there was a blend. So they, they couldn't really put an age statement on it because it was a blend of all kinds of uh, um, uh, different liquids from, you know, different years that had been resting for sure. They, you know, good quality. Like Johnny Walker is an example. Johnny Walker Green is a good example of a blended whiskey that doesn't have an age statement. And it's amazing. It is absolutely amazing. I love Johnny Walker Green. But then all of a sudden, the single malt craze came in. Like I say, it was about the 70s or so. Don't quote me on that, but I think. And, uh, and, and it was kind of a cool marketing idea to say, okay, we are going to say that, that this whiskey has been um, aged for you know 10 years or whatever. And it's from a single barrel, from a single distillery. It's not, it's not a blend. Don't forget, blends pay the bills. Never keep <coughs> blends because it, blends keep the lights on. 
blends pay the bills. But a lot of people like that single malt and they like the idea of knowing how long that, you know, single malt has spent in the barrel, whether it's 10 years or 15 years. And you do get, you know, 20, 22, 30, whatever. You do get a variation in the taste because certain things are happening. Certain flavors are becoming more concentrated because they're spending time in the barrel. Um, uh, the angel share, some of the alcohol is evaporating out of that barrel. So it's going to concentrate some of the other aromas and the flavors. And uh, and that's, you know, that suits a lot of people's palates. And, and I'm all for um, whatever suits somebody else. But for me, I've often been just as satisfied with a blend as I have been with a single malt. When it comes to age statements, McAllen tried this. Um, they started pulling their 18 years, that sort of thing, because they wanted to go to something that wasn't an age statement. No age statement, N-A-S. And this created an uproar among the, you know, the Scotch purists because they didn't want, they, they, they wanted that, that age clarification. Um, but McAllen came up with, with what were, there was a ruby, um, I can't even remember. There was four different ones. Well, I tasted those, you know, McAllen non-age statements against their age counterparts. Yeah. And to my taste, I actually really enjoyed um, what McAllen had done without an age statement. So it's it's personal preference. Do, we do should th- never th- criticize anybody else. Do Do you think that's a little bit in the mind? You know, uh, mm-hmm. when you're, you know, uh, when you when you get this 18 year old, you know, it's like there's just something that's already there. You know, it's like when when you, when you smoke Steve Saka's hundred dollar unicorn cigar, people sure. people, you know, I've said that is the best cigar they've ever had, and I'm like, well, I had it. And it was just another Steve Saka cigar is all it was. You know, so all the cigars are great. Yeah, that they're all great. All of them. Um, so when so that eighteen year, you know that that is that's in your mind, and then I could see the the non, you know the uh, the NAS uh, you you called it, you know, messing with people too, you know, trying to figure out, you know, the the eight, you know. So that's I didn't know that. So that, that is super super well, cool. What, what McCallan <coughs> was kind of looking at, they they wanted to give their their master, you know, blenders and distillers, they wanted to give them a chance to experiment. They wanted to give them an opportunity to try other things. It's just that the consumer didn't go for it, and that's unfortunate because I I actually what, I wish I could remember what the name of that was. It'll come to me. Um, I I actually really liked what McCallan was doing, and I I didn't I didn't really have a, a, a problem with it. Now I will tell you there are times when and if you're doing like a, a vertical tasting where you're tasting a 12 year versus a 15 year. See, I'm going up 12 year versus yeah. 15 year versus 18 year versus 25 year. You will see differences. There's no doubt about it. There are differences. Are they that different? I haven't tasted that very many where I have really felt they were that different. I remember the Glen Goyne 21. I absolutely adore that. I would pay double for Glen Goyne 21. Uh, Port Ellen 8th release, that's their 29-year-old, and that's a, an Isla whiskey. I, I would give anything to get another bottle of that because it was so sensational. But that means that you've got to taste a whole bunch of different Scotch whiskeys from that same manufacturer, from that same distiller, to know the comparison, to know whether it's right for you. And I'm not saying that taste is subjective. I don't think taste is subjective. I think taste is taste, right? Like an orange tastes like an orange. I've said this before. But I think preference is subjective. Um, and, And so, again, it's your dollar you spend money on what you like unless you're prepared to spend even more dollars, thousands of dollars to make, not to make, but to actually do an educated, controlled, technical tasting where, where things are so controlled, there can't be any outside influences because as soon as you get an outside influence, whether it's you change the shape of the glass or, or the lighting can make a different in a person's mind um the air quality can make a difference all these things can make the person themselves can make a difference what did they have to eat that day yeah. and if if a person who's doing a technical tasting isn't prepared like charlie monado said when we had him on the show he 
has something to eat, and then he waits two hours before he assesses a cigar. That's the right way to do it. And yeah. you don't, you know, you don't assess it outside because you're not getting the full value of a cigar. Just like, you know, you're with whiskeys, you're not getting the full value unless you have an, a controlled environment. But who wants to do that? That takes the fun out of it, right? For a it, lot it of people, does. that would you take know, the fun out of it. Steve Saka says that uh, only on one of his cigars, and that's a Sin Compromiso, he says, hey, mm -hmm. I do not want you smoking that outside. That cigar needs to be smoked inside um, yep. in, in an environment with, with no wind. Um, Les Brady asks, uh, um, do you remember McAllen cast strength? I love that, and I have not found it for quite a few years. And again, I'm going to go back to McAllen. The, the thing you got to remember about McAllen and, and great whiskey, um, and, and I like McAllen for a variety of reasons. Um, they're very approachable. Um, they're reasonably priced. Like their 15 year is very reasonably priced. But to get a cask strength, you're asking a lot of the <coughs> producer. They've got to keep that whiskey on hold. And there's all kinds of risks involved with keeping any barrel on hold. Because you never, you can never be sure the distillery, imagine yourself an owner of a distillery and you're holding on to these barrels knowing that some of it's evaporating. You don't know if there's going to be a fire. You don't know, you know, if somebody's going to screw up in the warehouse. All of these things add up to do we want to do a cask strength? Is it really worth it? And um, the other thing too is, don't you know, a lot of people overlook when it comes to Scotch whiskeys, there, a lot of their claim to fame came from the barrels they were using. They Scotch whiskey really like they it really likes sherry barrels. Sherry barrels are, are expensive. Sherry barrel sherry barrels can become pretty rare because a lot of people want a sherry barrel because that imparts a different aroma and different flavors to the finished Scotch whiskey. And so, you know, McAllen, that's part of what they were looking at when they were trying to go to this other format, the no age statement format. And there's a, there was a word for it. I can't remember what the term was. Um, but they were, they were trying to help themselves with their cask management. Barrels cost a lot of money. We mentioned once before, last I heard, you could get a bourbon barrel for 250 bucks. But as soon as you start getting into some of those European barrels, like a, like a French barrique, you're looking at 1200 euro. That's Good. a huge leap in cost. Yeah. So, you know, if you want a McAllen cast strength, if you can find one, more power to you. Sometimes they're out there, but <coughs> mm, I've never seen one. So, you know, and, you know, I wanted to bring up something else. Uh, Abe was on um, Meet the Professor this afternoon. I know. I got to rewind. I was, I was sleeping because I'm not feeling good. Said. And so I'm, I'm mm -hmm. going to, I'm going to go back and watch it. How was that episode? It was so good. It was so much fun. You know, what, what I really liked about this weekend is KMA had uh, Carlito on the yeah. show yesterday morning, Saturday morning. So that was super fun. And then Abe was on Carlito's show this afternoon. And one of the questions um, they asked was, you know, what's the first cigar you ever smoked, Abe? And so we thought about it for a minute and he said Royal Jamaica. Now, Royal Jamaica, good luck finding that one. I but know. my tobacconist, my tobacconist happened to get his get. hands on a Royal Jamaica box, one box. So he's only allowing one cigar per customer. But this is, if you, I don't know if you can tell how brown the wrapper is. Yeah. This had been sitting in a warehouse for a long time. This is an original Royal Jamaica cigar. And I'm thrilled that I was able to get one because Royal Jamaica did have a huge impact on the cigar world until it was no more. So, you know, whether we're talking cigars or whether we're talking whiskeys, little gems like, you know, the McAllen cast strength or a Royal Jamaica cigar, they can be found and they're just meant for that one time that you can try them. You know, they're, they're, they're just so special. And even the stuff that I've got in my lineup, um, like for instance, I've got one of the Blanton's Gold these are very hard to come by. And, someone someone you know, asked a question. Why, why is Blanton so hard to come by? Um, it's it's just a very very popular bourbon. People, oh, okay. People, yeah. It's just like E. H. Taylor. Yeah. You, you'll see it in one store and then you won't see it 
again for the rest of the year. Um, the Blanton's Gold was a very special bottling, um, you know, with the gold horse. So, you know, and my very first Blanton's, oh, where, here we go. My very first Blanton's actually was a special bottling done for a store in my old community of Edmonton. Here we go. And this is a wine and spirit label on it. But this was handpicked by the, the whiskey buyer <coughs> from Wine and Beyond. And I got that in about 2014. And I've saved the bottle. I don't save a lot of these bottles. But this one I did because it was just very, very special. Bottled at 93 proof. I, I wish I had bought a case. It was that yeah. good. So what some of the other producers are doing, we'll just kind of go through a bit of a lineup. This, this, I don't know if you've ever seen this shape of a bottle. I don't know if you can tell. Just, but it's kind just, of a... yeah, I, I, I've seen that um, uh, uh, because it fits in your pocket, doesn't it? Is that, isn't that why it's, it's indented like that? Your cowboy boot. Oh, your cowboy boot. Okay. I thought, you know, I, I often wore them like back pocket and I go, that never made sense why they would keep it in a back pocket. And then so it's your cowboy boot, so your leg fits against that. Okay. Then you could sneak it around. It now is that really a production bottle? Is that a production bottle? Because that label looks strange. I know it's a very strange label. This is actually Kings County Distillery. Uh, this is a New York product. Okay, Brooklyn, New York, and it's a peated bourbon. I haven't opened it yet. Somebody asked me what it tastes like. I haven't yet opened this. Um, but again. A peated bourbon is is very unusual because peat is typically associated with scotch. With, yeah. It gives a, it gives a smokiness, right? Yeah. When when what what they do is is they work with the grain and and they use peat to heat the grain to get it to germinate. So you're getting a a, a smokiness from that. So this one's kind of cool, and I, I like to save it because I think the bottle is worth the story. Yeah. But, you know, you can you can. So this is what we would call a Mickey because, um, you know, the Mickey fits into the boot. It's a smaller size. So I'm looking forward to tasting that one. Um, part of the reason I've got so many wild turkeys is because of the Kentucky spirit. I bought three bottles of this. I wish I'd bought a case. This is probably, you know, in my, in my top five bourbons. And I don't think you can get it anymore. Not in Canada anyway. Not from my, any of the stores around here. But it is absolutely delicious. Um, and, you know, when I buy three bottles of anything, that tells you something. Because there's yeah. so many you can choose from, right? But when I keep going back, that means that, that it just suited my palate, right? And um, this guy, I think, I forget what the, what the oh, hang on, I'm, 101 proof, right? So that's um, 50. 50 and a half, yeah, yeah, 50 and a yeah, half, so yeah. It's approaching cast strength, and that's what I like about it. I like something that's a little bit, uh, a little bit, uh, a little more body to it. And then the Eagle Rare, we don't, we don't get this a lot where I live, and it's, it's a huge hit. People love Eagle, Eagle Rare. So there's lots to choose from. You know, I, I finally got a bottle of Uncle Nearest. I haven't tried that yet. Um, this Barter House, this is part of Orphan Barrel. This one, they say it's been aged 20 years. That's a long time for bourbon. Bourbon, it's hot. It's hot in Kentucky. They yeah. they don't always go to twenty years, so that's kind of a cool one. Is that an expensive? This, is that an expensive whiskey? Because there can't be a lot back it left in the barrel after twenty years. Exactly, you're going to be paying more for that. This was a gift, right? So I don't really know what the value was. I was very grateful to get it as a gift. I'm very happy about that. Um, so I'll taste it and I'll let you guys know what it's all about. And then finally, you know, another one that I like to mention is Thomas Handy. Okay. This is a Sazerac rye. And um, this one, again, I have tasted this. It's very good. If you can find it, it depends on which one you buy. Sometimes what producer or what reviewers will do is they'll name a lot number. They'll say, oh, I tasted this particular whiskey and it was lot number such and such. And, and good luck finding that lot number again. It yeah. might not happen. Um, and I know that with this lot number, it, it did get a lot of attention. That's why it's still unopened. And that's fine. You can leave an unopened whiskey like forever. It, it, yeah. But once you open it, drink it. Don't, you you, don't you mentioned that a term that, that I've heard before on that, uh, Sazerac. Where have I heard that? Is that a common term in whiskey? For some reason, like yeah. the, I've, I've heard that term before. What does that mean? 
Well, it's it's like it's kind of a proprietary term for the producer, Sazerac Rye, right? It's okay, like so it's oh, the, oh, it's a brand. Okay, okay. Yeah. I like yeah. I said I didn't I'd heard that before. I just didn't understand what where I heard that in 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 relation to. So it's a brand. Okay, yeah, I didn't know if it was likely, a method or something. No, no. More likely, you're going to see um, just a Sazerac Rye, not the Thomas Handy. The Thomas Handy is a little harder to come by, for sure. Right, yeah. but uh, you know, there's lots of choices out there. Uh, you know, if you want a, a good everyday drink, a sipper, go for the Woodford Reserve. Um, Woodford Reserve does a lot for the whiskey community. It does a lot for um, uh, you know they're 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 the supplier to the Kentucky Derby and they yep. contribute a lot of money to the Jockeys Fund because you know that's something we don't really think about. Uh, you have a lot of people in the sports business that and horse racing is a sport they they can they can be hurt in the engagement yeah. of that sport they need the support of you know people like us who are willing to you know pay attention to what woodford reserve is doing and support the the philanthropic efforts of a company like woodford reserve and in the case of cigars the fuente family they yep. do a ton they do a ton with the cigar, the Fuente Family Cigar Foundation, uh, Abe from Smoke In, he donates a ton to charity with you know the the fundraisers that he does. Liana Fuente, for instance, this past week, <coughs> she raised over sixty thousand yeah. dollars for breast cancer research. That's huge. And she's getting ready to shave her head, and uh, <laughs> man, and I was I was looking at her on the show. What just a beautiful, beautiful hair she has. And um, I know what you know, I give for that hair. Like it's gorgeous. It, it is. But I am a but. fan of shaved head women. I love the shorter, oh. the, the shorter, the better. That is an absolute for me. That is hands down the, uh, the sexy thing on a woman, you know, with, uh, nice. you know, just a super, super shaved head. I see all these bottles here and someone had mentioned it earlier. There is no, no Irish whiskey. What, what is your, oh, what is I your thought? Okay. What, what are your thoughts of the, uh, of the Irish whiskey? Now I, you know, I used to drink Jameson and then yeah. Jameson came out with the, uh, uh, the cask aged and I don't drink anything. I don't even go back to regular Jameson now cause that bite is gone. What is the difference okay. between those two? I've really never looked up what, you know, what makes the Jameson cask age different than a regular Jameson. Do you happen to know offhand? Well, as soon as you hear the word cask, you can, you can kind of look at more aromas, more flavors, higher price, um, probably higher alcohol, right? But yep. what separates uh, Irish whiskey from all the, most of the others, I can't say all anymore because that's not true, but the, um, they do a triple distillation for Irish whiskey. They have always done typically triple distillation pot still. Now with a pot still, there's a lot more hands on it. When, when you get into some of these major producers, they're using a continuous still, like it goes 24 seven, 365, yeah, yeah. right? Whereas with a pot still, you, you have to, you have to have more uh, people hours involved. Um, so, you know, your cost is going to go up. The, mo the more you have to have human labor, your costs are going to go up. It's not automated. So, uh, you know, it's like any other artisanal product. It's like, you know, 300 hands touch every cigar that we smoke. It's the same thing with whiskeys. The more you get human labor involved, there's going to be a difference. There's going to be better quality control. There's going to likely be, not always, but likely be, uh, be um, better flavors and aromas coming from it because more attention is being paid. And the best way I can relate this is with wine. Because with wine, what happens is you have certain vineyards where all the grapes are hand harvested. So that means you've got people going through these rows of vines <coughs> and they're, they're cutting the grapes off of the vine, putting them into baskets, those baskets are then being taken to a sorting table where another set of eyes and or several sets of eyes and hands are working through them. So they're watching for things called material other mog, material other than grapes, M-O-G. 
Okay. And by material other than grapes, what they're talking about is lizards, wasps' nests, okay? These are all things that when you have mass-produced wines, you've, you've got this row of vines, and they're all perfectly planted, and then you've got this giant machine that goes, that it's got high legs, so it goes over top the of the vines, and it just goes down this row of vines, and it basically shakes the grapes off of the ripe grapes off of the vine and they fall into a big holding tank and then that big holding thing gets taken over to you know the the processing area and not a single set of human eyes or human hands actually sees any of those bunches and so anything can wind up in you know with those bunches of grapes and like for instance i think it was in italy that um because of a map, I shouldn't name the country because I'm not sure. So take that away. Okay. Edit that out. <laughs> um, but somewhere in Europe, somehow a wasp's nest did get missed and it got into the wine. And I, if I remember correctly, three people died because they were allergic to wasp venom. Really? But it was mixed. Yeah, it was mixed in with wine. But that's what's going to happen. If you want inexpensive wine, you have to be prepared that there's going for, you know, for the for the potential of material other than grapes finding its way into that juice you're drinking. So now that's is, it, why, is, is there a way to find out if your winemaker, like the wine you like, is a hand picked versus machine picked? Is that something that that I mean, are you able to research that and that's readily known? Yeah, sure. Uh, okay. Can. Um, but typically, if you're looking at a boxed wine or a wine at 20 bucks or less, not always, but okay, 15 or less, whatever, two buck chuck, as they used to call it, you can pretty much, you can pretty much figure that that's, you know, that there hasn't <laughs> been a set of eyes or hands on those grapes. They've just been mass, you know, mass picked, mass produced. So, you know, for me, and, and this is, this is kind of where it makes it difficult for me because people ask me, what wine do you recommend? And I always ask them, how much are you willing to spend? And if they're willing to spend $20, I can't recommend a wine to yeah. them because for me, wine starts at 50 bucks because yeah. then I know I'm getting grapes. I really don't have to worry too much that, that there might be material other than grapes in that juice. Uh, not all, that's not always a guarantee, yeah. but for the most part, right? So, um, you know, you, that, that's, that's the easiest way for me to relate what people can look for when they're spending money on something. If you think a juice, a liquid, whether it's scotch or wine or whatever, bourbon is expensive, sometimes you have to ask yourself, why is it expensive? Is it simply because of marketing? Are they, you know, is that manufacturer putting a lot of money into the packaging or, or the advertising or the marketing or because they're just greedy and they want the best dollar they can get? Or have they really taken the time with that product? Have they really taken, you know, put their heart and soul into it? You know, this is something that, that Carlito talks about a lot, how dedicated he and the Fuente family are in to producing really good quality cigars. And the same can be said for wine. The same can be said for bourbons or scotches. <coughs> any, any, any consumer good, really. You, you kind of, you, you, you do yourself a favor by doing, you know, by educating yourself a little bit. Yeah, for, uh, it, and that's the key, just education. Education and, you know, a, a lot of times you'll find out why, something is more expensive and then you'll appreciate it. You know, people, some people don't understand that and they buy bundled cigars, you know, they, they don't know any better, you know, and that's right. fine. If you like a $2 cigar, there's, no, there's no, nothing wrong with that. I have, wrong with it. I have bundled cigars in my humidor when I don't care about what I want to smoke or I know I'm busy and I'm only going to smoke half of it. I'd rather throw a dollar away than $6, you know, but sure. then you'll see some of the guys, you know, newer cigar smokers, they start asking questions. They start learning more and it's like, oh, that's why it's $8, that's $10, why. $12. And yeah. then, um, and, <coughs> and certainly there's producers you can trust. Like you can trust Drew Estate. I, I have yet to find a Drew Estate cigar that I haven't enjoyed. 
I have yeah. enjoyed all of Drew Estate cigars. Absolutely. We talked about Saka. I have enjoyed all of Saka's cigars. Absolutely. And keep in mind too that I, you know, I have a, an additional benefit because yes, yeah, sure. I get cigars and I can see the label, everything else, but I'm also a technical assessor for cigar sense. I don't know what I'm smoking. And sometimes, you know, when, you know, I get my shipments of cigars uh, for the assessment, I'm actually very surprised sometimes at, at, you know, what I've smoked, finding out what it is after, after I've done all of my technical notes. I had one today and I can't name it. I wish I could. It was phenomenal. And yes, it's the 15 to $20 range cigar. I'd pay 30 for it. It was that good. And it was from a producer that typically is known for powerhouse cigars. And this one was just friendly and easy to smoke. And it was amazing. So uh, that's what I would recommend to anybody who does want to develop themselves. If you, if you don't live in a community where there's classes, you can do it yourself. Spend a few dollars, buy some bottles, get a friend of yours to, you know, uh, create a blind tasting situation, whether it's cigars or whiskey or whatever, and either smoke the cigar or drink the liquid. Take notes. It's really important to take notes. Be, be fair to yourself and be fair to the product and then make a comparison on those things. And sometimes I think if people uh, drink something blind or smoke something blind without knowing what it is, I think sometimes they're surprised at the results. Yeah, it's a. Uh, uh, I, I, I guess I couldn't have said it better myself. Um, we're gonna we're gonna follow. We're gonna finish up with one last question, and, I'll, and I'm gonna shoot Brad this question, and then uh, I, I want to know his answer. But uh, I'll 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 have it because I was gonna ask both of you. Um, uh, you're being dropped off on a deserted island for a month. You can bring a month's supply of one cigar in one spirit. What is that specific cigar, and what is that specific spirit? That you're going to be smoking and drinking every day for 30 days. Every day for 30 days. Or, or as much as you want. You have a month's supply. You can drink. You can bring as much as you want. But one producer. One, Yeah, one specific cigar and one specific spirit. <laughs> I would have to say that overall, it would be the Drew Estate Lika Bravada number nine. I, that is just an easy, everyday cigar. I don't have to worry whether I'm smoking in the morning or in the afternoon or the evening. I can smoke that thing anytime. Now, okay? why the nine over the 50? Because that's like the biggest divide. I'm a 52 guy. I like a, a, a cigar that's a little, strong, you know, a little stronger than the nine. But then people tell me they like the nine because it's stronger than the 52. <coughs> that, again, is where we get into preference. It's what you prefer. Keep in mind, my palate tends to go to the cast strength. But when I talk about cigars, I'm not drinking typically, sometimes I have, but I'm not typically drinking a cask strength whiskey first thing in the morning. But I know from experience that I can smoke that Liga Pravada any time of the day and be very happy with it. And when it comes to whiskeys, this is going to go against everything I just said, but I loved that Port Ellen eighth release, 29 year old scotch so much. It was a life changer. Honest to God, when somebody says it changed my life, like when I say it changed my life, it really did change my life. That was the one that, that just said, man, this is the greatest stuff I have ever tasted, but you know, $2,500 a bottle now. Oh, good. Or more. God. Yeah. <coughs> But if I could have, you know, if I was, if this was being donated and it, I, it would be supplied to me for a month on a deserted island, that's what I'm going for. Why would I go for a $40 bottle of liquor? What? Okay, yeah. Now that's, you know, having said that, I always have this $28 bottle of Alberta Premium in my bar because I love it. But do I want to drink it every single day straight? No. But yeah. I do want to drink Port Ellen 29 year, eighth release, not the other ones. That one I would want to drink every single day. Oh, right on. I'll, I'll be interested to see what Brad's uh, Brad's uh, thoughts are on um, uh, on his, on what his is. So, all right, before we wrap up the show, um, uh, move on. You know, uh, we, we, skipped some, uh, we, we skipped some segments. We skipped some sponsors. Um, I'm sick. I didn't want to do a ton of research. Um, so, remember... Um, cigar Medics Humidimeter, as long as you're using a Cigar Medics Humidimeter, 
Every time you smoke a cigar, you'll always know when to hold them and know when to smoke them. Cigar Bundles of Miami, your one-stop shop for all your bundle cigars, rolled right here in Florida, the cigar capital of the country, and industry news with Fox Cigar. Industry news was pretty light this week anyways. Um, uh, make sure you're always checking out the uh, uh, the Cigar Prop News blog tag tab on our website, and it'll keep you up to date on all industry news throughout the week. And then also specials from great online retailers like Fox Cigar. Um, and tonight, um, uh, the Hireman Solomon Social Media Spotlight. Each week, I leave you a link in the description below for a cool YouTube video, Instagram account, or Facebook page that I found interesting. This week's spotlight is a video Brad did just recently, and it was actually a really cool, and I can't wait to try it, where if you get a, uh, um, a wonky burn on a cigar, um, someone had told him, uh, uh, lick your thumb and put it on part of the cigar that's burning uh, um, too fast, and it'll actually slow down, and it won't burn there, but it'll start burning on the other side, and it'll catch up. You know, I'm like, I'm going to have to try that, you know, because it makes sense if the if the tobacco is... Humidity. Burning. Yeah, the yeah. humidity's not going to want um, to burn right there, so that'll help catch it up. So it's a cool video um, uh, down below in the link. So uh, definitely check that out. And uh, now it's time for the Tapping Ash and Taking Names giveaway presented by Simpler Hair Color. Simpler Hair Color, I use it, so should you. Remember, if you won in the last 30 days, you're not eligible to, not, uh, to win. Giving away tons of great uh, cigars, Cigar Medics um, uh, Lighter, some soap from Siesta Key Soap Company. And um, we've got a random letter generator there um, here. So uh, it came up with uh, the letters um, uh, in a row, H, I, or A. Do we have a uh, first uh, first letter of your name H I or J? Um, we have um, Jim Miller. We have Josh Jones. Let's see uh, Jeff Carpenter. Jeff Carpenter won recently. Uh, Jim Miller is the last one to have commented. Josh or no Josh Josh Jones is the, is the last one to comment in. So with the J Josh Jones. Um, Send me an email, kevin at cigarprop.com, and I will send you out this prize package. Um, tomorrow night, I'm going to welcome to the show Dave Meyer and the crew from Wooden Indian Tobacco, and we also welcome Craig Benderslice, a.k.a. Cigar Craig. I'll be by my sh by myself for that show uh, tomorrow night. It's going to be just a, uh, um, a group of uh, really, really cool people. Uh, make sure you're following Brad at Zeal Cigars. There's all the links in the show notes below. Val, I'll wherever you can find her online. Links in the show notes below. Um, as also, once again, a big thanks to Cigar Bundles of Miami, Cigar Medics, Fox Cigar, Hireman Solomon Cigars, Stogie Road Cigars. They got a box coming our way, so um, the contest from here on out for the rest of the years will include some cigars from Stogie Road Cigars and Caravilla Hante. Um, simpler hair color. <clears throat> Man. And, of course, Drew Estate and Experience Asset. So yes, hopefully I'll be uh, I'll be better by hopefully I'll be at least better by tomorrow somewhat, um, and uh, we will leave everybody with uh, with our outro here. So we'll see y'all tomorrow night. Uh -huh.